Mom, I'm trying to concentrate. A long time ago, in the magical land of Equestria, there were six great ponies that were the best of friends. Though they didn't start out that way, before the return of Nightmare Moon, none of them knew each other very well at all. If it wasn't for a young unicorn who loved books far too much, the world would have been cast into darkness, and Celestia would have gone from the land she protected for a millennia. Thanks to the help of this unicorn, Nightmare Moon was defeated, and Princess Luna was returned. This key moment in the young mare's life created a bond that should have lasted a lifetime. A few years after Luna was returned to Equestria, her older sister Celestia decided to give her a school so she could shape young minds and help foster a new generation of unicorns to our great land. However, one fateful night, a new kind of weapon was used on Luna's school. Zebras, masquerading as refugees, snuck into the school and set it off killing the tribes of refugee pony zebras who were trying to escape their own land and rule over the new Caesar. And this weapon didn't just kill the tribes that took shelter at the school, but also all the fillies and colts that called the school home. The professors died. The ponies who ran the administration died. Parents died. Every pony died. But one. This led to escalating disagreements between the Zebra Lands and Equestria, eventually leading to a war. Celestia blamed herself for the deaths of so many, and stepped down as the ruler of Equestria and put her sister Luna in charge. The war started to get worse, and Luna needed help to run the government during this new war, hence the ministries were created. The six mayors who helped save Equestria previously were now the mayors who ran each ministry, the ministries grew the government, helping make new technology, formed new companies, and started secret projects to help win the war. Most of these projects never saw the light of day, even after the war ended and Equestria died. One such project was so well hidden that it stayed secret for almost 200 years. And that is until a desperate unicorn known as Grimoire Spell found hidden documents about this project. She only wanted to save her sick filly. She went into the lab where this project's power was hidden and awakened a demon. And this one action set into motion the actions that would destroy Equus. The evil laugh of Aquila lingers in my head. The way she taunted me as she took my power, took over my body, took over my mind. I felt the pleasure she felt as she finally did what she said she would so long ago. I was so close. If only I'd moved faster, pulled the trigger before she had time to stop me. I should have not taken time to have one last night with my friends, with my family, with Aura. Wait a second. If Aquila took over, then why do I feel like I'm lying in bed right now? I slowly opened my eyes. I was laying in Silver Snip's room. The same room she gave me when I was in cartwheel with her? I was under a few blankets, warm and comfortable. I hadn't felt this way since I'd left my stable. I moved my forelegs off from under the blankets and stretched. My mark two was still on my foreleg. That's a good sign at least. But why am I in Silver's home? The last thing I remember was Aquila taking over. She wouldn't have just let me take control again. But I noticed that I couldn't feel her at all. My head felt normal. Well, I had a bit of a headache, but not much else. Then I felt some pony shift in the bed with me, and a rear leg brush my own. I twisted around and saw a stallion with a greenish-blue coat and a straw-colored mane. He was sleeping, and his back was turned towards me. Why was I in a bed with a strange stallion? It didn't matter, whoever he was. He's not Aura, and he shouldn't be sleeping in my bed. I backed out of bed falling on the floor, yelling, Who are you? Why are you in my bed? The stallion jumped, then sat up quickly. He looked over at me with deep brown eyes. He rubbed his eyes, then said sleepily, Shadow, what's wrong? He had a very rich voice, and he spoke like a pony who knew me, but I had no idea who this pony was. I backed up, then, still sitting on my ass, said, Who are you? 
He looked confused for a moment. What do you mean? It's me, Wingnut, your husband. Ah, shit. He said, then turned his head towards the door of the room and yelled, Grim, it's happening again. You're not Wingnut. Don't lie to me. Wingnut's a colt, and you're not, I said. He sighed. Shadow, I know everything's a little confusing at the moment. I am Wingnut. We've been married for eight years. I looked at him in horror. Fuck you, this is a dream. It has to be. She sighed again, but didn't move from the spot on the bed as he asked. Shadow, what's the last thing that you remember? Aquila, she took over my body, I said. His face relaxed a little. Good, I thought you might have gone back to when we first met. Shadow, Aquila isn't. The door opened and Mom stood there. Why not? How many times do I have to tell you to wait for me when she wakes up like this? I glared over at her and started to pull out my magic. I didn't know what was going on, but Mom has to be behind this. As soon as I touched my magic to ready a spell, extreme pain flowed from my horn. I screamed and fell back to the floor. It's happening! Mom ran over with a look of concern on her face, saying, Shadow, let the magic go. I did, and the pain stopped. Looking up at her, gasping a little to catch my breath. What did you do to me? She sighed. Nothing, sweetie. You did it. Ten years ago, you did something with your magic that broke something inside of you. Your horn cracked, and ever since then, you've had a hard time doing any kind of magic. Even telekinesis is hard for you. I don't remember doing anything like that. I said, trying to back away from her. She said the last thing she remembers is the Quilla taking over. Wingnut, if it is Wingnut, said. Mom looked over at him. What time? He shrugged, and so I said, Near Los Alicorn? So the time you tried to kill yourself. Well, that's good. At least it wasn't the one where you thought she took over Stable 28. Huh? I asked. She put a hoof on my shoulder, ignoring my attempts to pull away from her. Shadow, when you hurt your magic, you also damaged the memory spell I had put on you. The barrier broke, and it also broke your mind. At first, no pony noticed until you started talking about some pony named Aquila who was trying to take over your mind. For a while, your friends believed you, until you destroyed Mill City Tower. What does that have to do with my magic or my memories? That was a couple weeks ago. I hate what I did, but I can't change it. I said. Wingnut spoke up. Shadow, that night you killed Stardust and your father Nightshade. When Aura died, you lost grip on reality. I felt my heart stop as he said that. No, Stardust is fine. We took him to Stable 98, and Dad wasn't even there. He flew out and out of the building as the stranger. Mom sighed. Shadow, the stranger wasn't your father, it was your uncle, Stryker. When you destroyed Mill City Tower, you turned on him, the one pony who tried to stop you. You overpowered his gems that protected him from most unicorn magic and killed him too. When you went after Stable 97, and once you used the Mark II to open the stable, you killed every pony inside. What they were saying couldn't be real. I didn't do any of that. No, you're lying. I wish you was. Wingnut said. It took Windthrasher and I three weeks to find you. We followed you all the way back to New Pegasus, where you were going after Grimm. That's when you hurt yourself more. You wanted me dead, but you wanted to remember who I was before you killed me. So you used a memory spell you found in a book to overpower the memory spells placed on me. My wards made it impossible for you to get into my head, but you managed to fix my memories and broke your own. Mom said. If that's true, then why didn't I kill you? I asked. Wingnut got off the bed, saying, Because Windthrasher Doorstop and I stopped you. Grim did what she could to help fix what was wrong, but she couldn't fix everything. Every now and then your mind seems to slip back to a false past. The one where Aquila is trying to take you over is the most common. Mom said. That can't be. It was only a few weeks ago that I was in the Twin Cities. 
I said. Shadow, that was ten years ago, Wingnut said. Eyes went wide, and I said quietly, Ten years? Yeah, ten years. Most of the time you're okay, but you do have days like this, and it's becoming common for Grim and I to have to calm you down. But don't worry, you'll remember everything soon enough, Wingnut said. Reality started to hit me. I got to my hooves, slowly, and walked over to the mirror set against the far wall. I looked different, older. I had a couple of lines on my face. Scars ran over my chest, hooves, neck, and face. I could see a small crack in my horn from what I assumed was the spell Mom told me about. Then I saw my cutie mark. It was burned away and replaced with a dashite mark. What happened to my cutie mark? I asked. Two Enclave officers caught up with you a week after you destroyed Mill City Tower. One knew that you were related to Grimm and decided to mark you as it, so... Pegasus who betrayed a Conclave, Wingnut said. No, you did make it up by, to her by cutting her head off a day or so later when you escaped with them, Mom said. This is real? I'm not just having another bad dream? I asked. Aura's dead. Stardust is too. Yeah. Wingnuts up with a sigh. It took a long time for you to come with terms with both of their deaths. I looked at Mom. Why are you here? Why are we in Cartwheel? The town was destroyed. No, it wasn't, Mom said. That was another false memory. We moved in, what, eight years ago now, Wingnut? He nodded. Yeah, this house was a gift from Box Tape after our wedding. Ah, uh, yes, Mom said. Well, I moved in with you two to help you, and you have problems with your memory. As they talk, a flash of Wingnut and me standing with each other in front of a small assortment of ponies came to my mind. I could remember saying some vows to him, then him saying his own. Some of which being that he would always take care of me, and how he'd always be there for me even if I couldn't remember him. Then I saw myself destroy Mill City Tower, killing the stranger, going to Stable 97, cutting off the head of a young mare called Shortcake. I saw myself using the rangefinder on three more towns as I attacked any settlement that worked with the Enclave. Another vision of me holding a small knife to Wingnut's neck as he tried to tell me I was dreaming and everything would be okay now. I've done some bad things, haven't I? Yes, sweetie. But we've been here for you through all of it, Mom said. I take it some things are starting to come back? I think so. So Aquila's not real? I asked. Not in the way you are thinking of her, no. Aquila was a form of magic that I used to help you when you were young. After I did that, we went to Stable 28 so we could hide from Elder Wolfsbane, who wanted to take you and my old Mark II for his own. Mom said, but I interrupted. Then why did you leave? I asked. Wolfsbane found out where I was, so I ran away, leaving you behind with a vein. You were the one that he wanted more than anything, so I needed to keep you hidden from him. I needed you to get older so you could prepare yourself for what happened later. My hope was that with how different you looked and with age, Wolfsbane wouldn't find out who you were. I left you clues on how to find me when you got out, but then my own memory was messed with. What about falling shadows? I asked. Mom smiled a little. That turned out to be a weapon that was never finished. I hoped that it was something that could be used to fix Equestria, but I was wrong. Grim and you found and destroyed the program that ran the project nine years ago, Wingnut said. I took a moment to think back. Scattered bits of memory started to come back to me. Mom and I taking down the terminal in the Lucky Horseshoe, sealing the power source for Falling Shadows, using Solar Fair's rangefinder to destroy a huge tower in what had to have been the Badlands. A few more things came to me, but it didn't help explain everything, though I was starting to believe what Mom was telling me. I got to my hooves, saying, I'm just having a hard time taking it all in, but I'd be a fool not to trust you, though I still can't believe that I'm married to Wingnut. He laughed a little. I was a little shocked when you accepted the proposal when I asked. I told him he should have waited a couple more years. 
even if the two of you did love each other. He was the same age as you were when you left the stable. But once Wingnut had an idea, he can't stop himself. Mom said with a chuckle. I heard a door open from down the hall, and a young filly's voice echoed down the hall. Grandma, I'm hungry. Mom's eyes went wide as she smiled a little as she said, Who's that? Wingnut answered. I was hoping to tell you before Night Blossom woke, but it can't be helped. He looked over at Grim and said, Grim, would you mind getting her breakfast and making sure Shining Star is up too? It's no problem, Wingnut. Join us downstairs once you've talked things over with Shadow. Mom said, walking out of the room, saying, Good morning, sweetie. How about we go wake your brother and see what Grandma made for you this morning? I want sugar apple bombs. The filly, who I'm guessing was Night Blossom, said. Mom chuckled, and her words were lost as she headed down the hall. Once they were gone, I looked over at Wingnut. Grandma? My mother's their grandmother. He nodded. Yeah. Night Blossom's eight. She was born not long after we got married. Kind of one of the reasons I asked you. Shining Star is five. There are foals. Started to shake at the thought of having foals. Even worse, foals I couldn't remember. But I can't remember them. How are they going to react to me? Wingnut put a hoof on my shoulder, then pulled me into a loving hug. Shadow, they understand in their own way that you have memory problems. Night Blossom's a smart young filly. She knows how to work around it. Shining Star understands for the most part, but just thinks of you as being sick sometimes. I started to panic a little. I don't even know how to interact with them. What do I say? What do I do? He tugged me tighter. Don't worry. You'll be fine. Just be yourself. Give them hugs and kisses. Tell them their good morning and tell them that you're not feeling well today. They'll understand. We have two very smart and wonderful foals. I took in a deep breath and calmed down a little. Okay, I'll try. I said, then another question came to me. You told me what happened to Aura, Stardust, and my father? But what about Windthrasher? He pulled away and looked at me sadly. It'd be best not to talk about her. Wing that she's my friend, I said. He closed his eyes and shook his head, saying, She's no one's friend, Shadow. Not anymore. I gave him a stern look. Wingnut, tell me what happened to her. He sighed. Fine. Windthrasher lost her battle for the bloodlust four years ago. She went crazy and killed a lot of ponies. Now she lives near Frosty Summit. Violet keeps tabs on her when she can, but we still get stories now and then about a monster who drinks the blood of ponies near there. I felt my heart sink a little as I asked. So Dr. Gauze couldn't find a way to help her? He did, but it took longer for him to find the cure. By the time he did, she'd already lost her mind. Spitfire's Flight Academy was one of the first places she hit when she returned. She killed every pony there, he said sadly. Grimms tried to find her a few times to put her out of her misery. Same for you, but she's very good at hiding. What about Uncle Ori? I asked. No one's seen him in ten years. One day he just vanished when the sins all fell apart. He answered. Smiled a little. At least they're all dead. He started to head towards the door and said, Not all of them are. Envy lives in town here now. Grim's been able to help him adjust to a new life, and he's not a bad... Pony? I guess you could call him that. But he's still a dick. Greed, who goes by his old name Thundercracker, lives in New Appleton now and runs the town. Sloth helps the kingdom. The rest are dead, though. Now come on. If we take too long to get breakfast, Grim will be on you again for not eating enough. Took in a deep breath, still taking it all in. Okay, let's go. We made our way out of the hallway to the main living area. Some pony had changed the set up sometime over the years because it didn't look like anything like it had when Silver lived here. A small dining room was next to the small kitchen, and a living room was now where the shop used to be. 
Sitting in the dining room table sat Mom with two foals. The first reminded me a lot of Wingnut, only with a horn, a silver and black striped mane, and red eyes. The filly, who was small for her age, had a dark purple coat, a bright pink and blue mane, and emerald green eyes. She was a pegasus, which caught me off guard. Then I remembered my father was a pegasus, so it made sense in a way. When the filly saw me, she smiled wide and flew over to me, hugging me tight, almost knocking me over. Mom, you're up. Great. Can I go over to Auntie Vervain's house later? She wanted to show me how to disassemble a sprite bot today. As soon as the filly hugged me, flashes of memories came back to me, giving birth to my daughter with Mom and Wingnut around supporting me. The joy I felt after naming her after my father's line to honor his memory. Memories of playing with her in our small living room, telling her stories of her grandfather and myself with a when I was younger. As memories came, I smiled and pulled her closer. Good morning, Blossom. You'll have to ask Grandma about that. I believe she needed help with the clinic today. Mom smiled. Getting the memories back quickly, I see. I nodded. They're coming back to me little by little. I said, looking over at Shining Star, who was trying to levitate a spoon. How's my little colt doing this morning? Mom, I'm trying to concentrate, he said, then dropped the spoon. Now you made me mess up. Wingnut walked over to him and ruffled his mane. It's okay, Shining. You'll get it sooner or later. Yeah, just give it time, I said, getting up and hugging my daughter again. She yawned and looked up at me. I thought you could levitate things when you were younger than Shining. I could, but because of my illness when I was young. Grandma and Grandpa told me I had to be careful. I explained. Mom laughed a little. Your mother was also a very powerful unicorn when she was born. It's a rare thing, but if it helps, yeah, I was a lot older than Shining when I got the hang of it. We tried to make the spoon float again, his horn glowing red like my own. As he tried, Night Blossom looked at me again and said, Do I have to help Grandma today? I looked over and said, That's up to you, Mom. Do you need her today? Mom shrugged. One of my apprentices should be able to help me if I need it. So if she wants to go see Vervain, and I think that's fine. Awesome! My daughter said, jumping up and down, her wings fluttering. I can't wait! Dad, are you going there today, too? Wingnut, who was sitting at the table, now eating his breakfast, nodded. Yeah, Vervain needs help with some new project of hers. You can head over there if you want with me. I smiled, headed over to the table, when something moved in the corner of the living room. Turning, I felt my heart skip a beat as a huge beast uh, stretched, then got to its massive paws. It was twice the size of a normal pony, made out of sticks with leaves for eyebrows and glowing purple eyes. I took a few steps back as it advanced on me. Why wasn't anyone doing anything? What is that? I asked, backing away until I bumped into the table. Mom sighed and said in an amused tone, Twig's your pet, sweetie. He's a timber wolf you saved from a fire a few years back. Goddesses know why you keep the beast. He smells like moss and doesn't listen to any pony but you. I was still shaking as the timber wolf came closer to nuzzle the top of my head. Then he turned towards Mom and growled a little before curling up next to me and closing his eyes. I looked over at Mom. I guess he doesn't like you much. And the feeling's mutual. If he wasn't well behaved around you as he is, then I would have tossed him out years ago. Mom said as she served me a meal of what looked like fresh veggies. Wingnut chuckled. At least he, she doesn't let him sleep in our room anymore. I don't know how many times I've woken up to his creepy stare. Shining Star, who was finishing his meal, looked at me. I like him, Mom. He's cool. My heart was still racing, but I managed to reach a hoof out and pet Twig's head. I guess he's not that scary. At least, it's not a hellhound or something. If... You brought a hellhound home. I would have to have you committed, Wingnut said. Twig growled again, but didn't get up. I just chuckled. I guess not everything's come back to me yet. 
Still can't remember what I was going to do today. You need to open up the shop. I saw a couple of couriers here from last night. I'm sure there's work piled up there, too. Mount said. Shop? What shop? I asked. The question express, remember? Box tape left it to you when he passed away a few years back? Mom said, getting to her hooves, then kissing both the foals before heading towards the door. I'll be back later. I need to check on how things are going with the new wall. Shadow, I'll stop by later to see how you're feeling. If you're getting tired or having problems with your memory again, close the shop early and head over to Vervain's. Shining Star jumped to his hooves and said in a happy voice, I'm going with you today, Mom. I laughed. Don't you want to go see Vervain? No, she always wants me to study things. I want to go with you today, please. He said with big red eyes. I chuckled a little. Fine, but you'll be good, okay? Good luck with that. The little squirt's a monster with a horn. Wingnut said with a laugh. So he's just like his father? I said as I got up. He laughed harder. Damn right. Damn right, Shining Star said, jumping up and down. I rolled my eyes. Good job, Wingnut. I'll let you explain to my mother later how our son learned a new fun word. Dad's gonna get in trouble, Night Blossom said with a snicker. I just shook my head, ignoring Wingnut's look of terror, and headed out the door. Twig getting up to follow me with Shining Star repeatedly saying, Damn right, damn right, <laughs> Don't push your luck, kiddo, I said, laughing. Shining Star quickly stopped. Over the next few hours, I ran things at a question express. It felt odd being here without box tape around. I must have added my own touches to the place over the years. I saw my old duster framed behind a desk, box tape's cape from his power armor next to it. Misery was displayed on one wall, and so was Aura's spear. The room box tape used to use was a sitting room now, set up with packages and orders for a courier to take. From what I could tell, I had over 50 couriers here that traveled all over the area. I thought it'd be an easy to do job, but I was wrong. Cartwheel was one of the main trading outposts for New Pegasus. Ponies came in all day to either send out packages or pick something up that the couriers brought in. As the day started to come to an end, two of my couriers came in, and I was surprised. One was Solstice, and the other Envy, both laughing. Solstice looked the same as she did, just a little older. Envy, however, changed his look a little. His mane was still done up in long dreadlocks, but he had them pulled back into a ponytail. His eyes were blue now instead of purple, and he looked happy. My first reaction was to grab the sword off the wall and run it through his face. Then I remembered that he was good now. Doesn't mean I still don't want to do it. He looked over at me with a smile still on his face and said, Hey, boss. Good to see ya. Um, hey, Envy. I said, still not sure what to say to the former sin. What's wrong, shrimp? You look like you've seen a ghost. Envy asked, his face falling some. Maybe she's feeling sick again, Solstice said. Twig was lying on the floor next to the desk, looked up at both of them, growling a little before going back to sleep. I just chuckled a little, saying, Yeah, I'm still trying to get used to things again, but I'm remembering as the day goes on. Envy rolled his eyes, throwing a bag of something on my desk, ruffling through it. So, you feel, think I'm a sin, and probably think I'm here to kill you? The thought did cross my mind. I said, I hate when this happens. He sat, then continued. You helped me realize that I just wanted real friends ten years ago after you almost killed me. You took me prisoner at first, then showed me how to live a better life, and blah, blah, blah. He said, waving his hoof around a little, and took a deep and irritated breath. Once you helped Grim get back to our side, I saw that life could be better. Even for someone like me. So I joined you and became a carrier. There, you're caught up, he said sarcastically. Solstice just face-hoofed. Envy, you're hopeless. He shrugged a little. At least I didn't scare her like last month. 
Anyway, we both just got back from the kingdom, Solsa said, setting a bag of caps down on the desk. Here's the cup for the shop. I took it and wrote the number down on a ledger. Any news from the kingdom? Envy answered, Not much, really. Enclave's been pushing closer, but Emperor Fruit Stripe is sure they can keep them at bay. Looks like they're trying to get the Steel Rangers to help them out by promising them land near the kingdom. Emperor Fruit Stripe? What happened to his parents? And I wondered to myself as I listened to them tell me about what they saw and more news from the east. Once they finished and Envy said his goodbye, Solstice said, So are you feeling up for a drink in town when you close? I thought you could fill me in on how things were going around here. I haven't seen you in a month. As she looked at me, a few quick flashes of memory came. Solstice and I, sitting in a dark corner of a local bar, our faces close as we talked. Another of us in the small room we rented in Cartwheel. One of me crying into her shoulder as she comforted me the night Box Dave died from pneumonia. I blushed a little. I have Shiny with me right now. He's playing in the other room. She moved closer, whispering. Then drop him off with Grim. She'll understand. I'm sure Wingnut will be working late as always. She kissed my nose. I haven't seen you in a month, Shadow. I've missed you. I can't believe it. Was I really cheating on my husband with Solstice of all ponies? How long has this been going on? I looked into her eyes, and it was almost like looking into Aura's. Solstice's eyes were a darker blue, but they still held the same fierceness that I loved about Aura's. I couldn't help blushing a little as I nodded. Solstice, I'm still not remembering things well. Are we, uh... Thang? She nodded a little. We have been for a while. Even before you married Wingnut. I remember you've only married him because he knocked you up. We had a fight over it, but then I forgave you because you'd been drinking and I was gone for two months. We agreed that it'd be fine if you stay with him, but you'd still be mine. I... I don't remember that. But I guess that's not saying much, is it? I responded. She hugged me, saying, You will soon. So, what do you say? Thinking you can ditch the cute colt for a couple hours? I had no idea what to do, but from the look on her face, I had a feeling this was normal. So I sighed and said, Sure. Great. I'm looking forward to it. She said with a giggle. Auntie Solstice! Shining yelled from the other room. He ran in and jumped onto her back. She laughed harder, then used one of her wings to push the colt off. He laughed, too, as he fell to the ground. She looked down at him and said, You're getting bigger every time I come to town, kiddo. Grandma says I'm going to be as big as Grandpa, he said, jumping up and down. Did you bring me a present? Don't I always? Solstice asked pulling out a small wooden carving of a zebra. Emperor Fruit Stripe made this. Ah, that's not a toy, Shining said as he sulked. Shining Star, what do we say when you're given a gift? I asked sternly. He looked down at his hoof, saying in a monotone voice, Thank you, Auntie Solstice. I'll treasure it as always. Do you think it was Sol Stardust's kid with a response like that? What was that last part? I asked in a tone that spelled a doom for the colt. He looked away from me, but I could tell as he rolled his eyes. Thank you, Auntie Solstice. She chuckled to herself, then rubbed his mane. You're welcome. Hey, Shining Star, why don't we close up early so you can show Grandma what you got? I asked. Okay, Mom, he said in a sad voice. I just shook my head as Solstice laughed harder. Colts will be colts. Does that timber wolf have to follow you all the time? Solstice asked as we made our way over to her place. I dropped Shining Star off with Mom. Night Blossom was already home and working on something in the living room when I got back. I told Mom I was going out with Solstice to get a drink. Mom wasn't too happy about me going to the bar when I was ill, but I won in the end. He doesn't like to leave my side, I said as Solstice unlocked the door and showed me in. She looked over at Twig, saying, Stay out here. She's not going to get hurt in my place. He growled at her and pushed her 
away into his living room. Once inside, he moved over to her couch, jumping onto it and laying down. I sighed and said, Guess that's a no. Fine, whatever. Just as long as he stays here, Solstice said. She led me towards her room, and as soon as we were past the threshold, she pressed me against the wall, kissing me deeply. My heart... A couple of days passed with me doing the same old thing. I'd wake up after being out late with Solstice, finding myself next to Sleeping Wingnut. I'd yawn, head to the bathroom, wash up, then get the foals up. I'd help Mom make breakfast with the family, eat with them, and get Night Blossom and Shining Star ready for the day. Then I'd open a Question Express, chat with customers, talk with my couriers, talk with Envy, who still made me feel strange up close, then go out with Solstice again. Everywhere I went, Twig followed. I started to figure out that he'd only listen to me. If any other pony got too close to me or said something that upset me, he'd growl at them. He was always sweet to me, though. He'd nuzzle me when he could, lick my face when he was happy, and sleep next to me when he was tired. Every pony in town hated him, but honestly, I liked having him around. In a small way, it reminded me of having my uncle around, even if none of that was real. On the fourth day since I woke up with my memories gone, I was able to remember almost everything that happened to me since Aura and Stardust died. I was glad because I felt normal again, though I did catch myself looking at my brand now and then. Today, I was having Solstice run a Question Express so Vervain could take me to Stable 28. It was one memory I hadn't gotten back. I'd asked her the day before when she came to have dinner with us about why I hadn't heard from Milkshake in a while, or why I couldn't remember if she had a filly or a colt. She told me it was attacked again by the Enclave, and every pony died during the raid. I couldn't believe it, so I asked her to show me. So now, Vervain, Twig, and myself were walking to the stable. As we got closer to Green Mist Valley, Vervain said, I see Solstice and you have been going out a lot out of late. I shrugged and said, She's my best friend. She's gone a lot, so it's nice to see her sometimes. She sighed. You can pull that crap on your mom and the rest, but I know you better than they do. You know that sooner or later Wingnut's going to find out. I can't get anything past you, can I? I asked. You never could and never will. Do you know how much it will break Wingnut's heart? What about your foals? She replied as we approached the green mist. Auntie Ravane, she makes me happy. So does Wingnut. Why can't I just have both? I asked. That's not how this works, Shadow. You're going to have to make up your mind, she said as she gave me some radix and pushed into the mist. I followed after downing the small pills. The only choices I have is to break my best friend's heart, or lose a mare I care about, or break up my family. I don't like either choice. Shadow, you only have one choice. You need to break it off with Solstice before Wingnut finds out. I don't know how you've gotten away with it for so long. Vervain said as we made our way through the thick mist, my pip buck clicking slightly. We not trust me. That's how we've been, able to get away with it for so long, I said as the cave entrance to Stable 28 came into view. My point exactly. He trusts you. Don't throw it back in his face. I mean it. If you don't put a stop to this soon, I will. I'm not going to watch you throw your life away again over a mare, she said as we walked into the dark tunnel both turning on our pip lights. You wouldn't, I said in shock. Shadow, I saw what happened to you over the months when Aura died. You don't take loss well. You never have. If you get caught, you'll lose everything. You're a mother, and a mother needs to think about her children, not herself, she said with a sigh. I stayed quiet for a long moment as we made our way to the door to Stable 28, Finally, as the opening was coming into sight, I said, I'll talk to Solstice tonight. Good. Now let's get this over with. This place brings back too many bad memories, Ravane said. Maz went wide as we came up to a door of Stable 28, or lack thereof, where the giant gear-shaped door once was, now stood a gaping hole. I grew closer to it and saw the door was jammed into the far wall, dried blood around where it now rested. I took a step back and asked, What could do that to a stable door? No pony knows. 
It was like this when we came to investigate after we heard the Enclave attacked. Everybody was dead, including Milk, Chick, and Balefire. Broke my heart when I found them. Ravain said, sniffing. You believe me now? I nodded and looked down as I said, Let's go home. I can't look at this right now. I wish I'd have just listened to you when you told me what happened before. Good idea, Ravain said, turning to leave. But I understand why you needed to see it for yourself, sweetie. I took one last look inside the dead stable that used to be my home, then sighed, turning to leave. I stopped when I found myself face to face with Twig. Come on, buddy. Let's go home. Twig pushed past me, walking into the stable. I turned back, yelling, Twig, get back here right now. He ignored me and pushed further into the darkness. Sighing again, I followed after the stubborn timber wolf. I finally caught up to him in the middle of the atrium. He was sitting in the middle of the empty place, looking up towards the window of the overmare's office. Twig, what are you doing here? We need to go home. There's nothing here anymore apart from sad memories. I said. He turned his massive head towards me, his glowing purple eyes staring deep into mine. Then he shook his head slowly, then pointed a paw up at the overmare's window. Frowning, I looked up, trying to figure out what he was trying to tell me. Is some pony up there? He shook his head again and kept pointing, so I looked again. For a moment, all I saw was a grimy window. Then I saw what he was pointing at. Etched into the window, almost covered in the grime, was the outline of the Aquila constellation. I took a few steps back, and as I did, a deep voice filled the atrium. Deceived! Who's there? I said, turning around in a circle, but all I could see was Twig watching me with his bright purple eyes. Then the voice echoed again. Trapped! Twig, let's get out of here. I said, breaking towards the door. But he didn't follow. He just kept watching me. Not real. Must break cage! The deep voice said again. I bolted for the door not knowing what was going on in my dead home, but not wanting to find out. As I did, Twig followed me, running past me for the door. As we ran, the voice said again, Must kill every pony. Only way, only key, have to stop her. I screamed as the voice seemed to follow me all the way to the atrium, out the stable door and through the tunnel. Kill! Kill! Must get free. Shadow, where are you? I heard Ravane say from the mouth of the tunnel. I ran faster, wanting to get as far from the horrible voice until it said one word that stopped me in my tracks. Star, listen to me. What did you call me? I asked the darkness around me. Shadow, where are you? Ravane yelled again from up the tunnel. But I ignored her. The voice came again this time, even closer. Star. My eyes went wide as I heard the voice of the only pony on Equus who calls me by that. Uncle Ori? Is that you? I asked. Yes. Where, where are you? Where have you been? I asked the darkness. Need. To kill them, he said. Kill who? I asked, still looking around the tunnel, but I couldn't tell where he was. Every pony. Not. Real. Dream. Nightmare. Cage. Trapped. He said. Uncle Ori, show yourself and talk to me. You're not making any sense. I said. Stop. Aquila, he said. She's not real, I said as I realized that something was wrong. He couldn't be my uncle. My mind was just trying to pull me into that fake life again. Neither are you. Real world, not world. Fake, you kill before light, he said again, his words coming out in segments. I shook my head. I'm not falling for it. Star, 
Trust me, he said again, and as he did, I realized that Twig was watching me. As the voice spoke, my timber wolf came closer and nuzzled the top of my head, and the voice said again, Trust, love, all heart, never to you, never lie you. I looked up at Twig. It can't be. A shot echoed down the tunnel, and Twig was blasted into the wall as Vervain came running down the tunnel. Get away from her, you beast! Vervain, what are you doing? I yelled as Twig got back to his paws, growling at her. A strange black fluid dripping from his body. Shadow, get away from him! Vervain yelled, pointing her battle saddle at Twig. But he pounced at her, knocking her over as he ran by. Vervain, why are you attacking Twig? I yelled as she tried to turn and fire on him again. There's something evil about him. I heard that voice. We have to kill him. Vervain yelled as she pulled away from me and fired up the tunnel at Twig, who was watching us, still growling. There's nothing bad about him. He's just a shadow. I yelled, trying to stop Vervain. Shadow, you have no idea what you're talking about. She said, turning back towards me and slapping me hard in the face. I knew we shouldn't have let you keep him. He's a monster. Pain started to build from my horn as she slapped me, and anger rushed through me. Vervain! I used the small amount of power inside me and pulled one of the rifles from her battle saddle and pointed it at her. Don't shoot him! She looked at me in horror. Shadow, how dare you point a rifle at me? Put that down before you hurt some pony. No, Twig isn't a monster. He might even be Uncle Ori. I need to know. So, just leave him alone. He hasn't hurt any pony. I said angrily. The look she gave me was unlike any other I'd seen in her face. She was enraged. Vervain was one of the most reasonable ponies I knew. If I was this upset about something like this, she'd listen to me, not treat me like this. She also would never hit me like that. She'd slap my horn when I was being a little brat. But she'd never slap my face like she did. You're not thinking straight, she said, then turned to fire at Twig, who still hadn't moved from his perch. Small black something dripping from his side. Vervain, don't, I yelled, but she ignored me and started to pull down on the bit of her battle saddle. I was faster, and the Wolfram rifle I stole slammed into her side, throwing her back into the wall. She fell on the floor of the cave in shock looking up at me as she couldn't believe what was happening. She looked down at the blood soaking through her thin barding, then back at me again. Shadow, you shot me. I went to run to her side, unable to believe what I just did. Vervain, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to. Twig came down the tunnel again and slowly pushed me away from Vervain, the voice echoing again. Too close. Must die. No, I yelled, trying to push past the huge timber wolf. Auntie Vervain, I can get you help. Vervain didn't respond to me. When I was finally able to see her properly, as my pip light found her face in the darkness again, I saw that she was gone. Blood was dripping from her muzzle, and her eyes looked vacant up at me. Shock and disbelief still plastered on her face. I dropped the rifle and slowly walked towards her. Twig finally let me pass. Vervain? I said slowly, shaking her with a hoof. Please. No. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I felt a paw on my shoulder, and I flinched, then looked back at Twig, who was looking down at me with his glowing violet eyes. Then the voice came again. I don't have long, Star. There's still too much magic keeping me from fully reaching you. Uncle Ori, your twig? I asked, pulling away from the timber wolf. He nodded. In a way, I'm using this body so Aquila won't notice me. Listen, this world isn't real. The memories you're getting aren't real. Yes, it is. You can't trick me into believing the other memories I had are true. I know that I killed Stardust. Aura is dead. I have a life now. A good one. I said trying to get further away from him, but the tunnel wall was blocking me. Damn it, Star! 
Don't be like your mother. I'm telling you the truth. Remember what happened right before Aquila took over? He said with a growl. It was hard for me to remember anything from that other life. Most of those memories were foggy. Those I thought back on it, I remembered Ori Callus doing something right before my body was taken from me. I looked back at him. You merged with my horn. Yes. I planted all of myself into your power as it was being pulled into you by Aquila. She's keeping you locked up while she uses your body like a puppet bent on destruction. You need to unlock this cage before she makes you forget who you really are and fully takes over. You don't have long, he said as he shook his head and growled. Unlock the cage? How? I asked. I can't hold on much longer, he said. You have to do something that Aquila thinks you could never do. Something so outside of your normal behavior, like killing loved ones. I don't understand. Why would I have to do that? Uncle Ori, tell me. I... I begged. Trust yourself, Star. Remember who you are, he said with a fading voice. Remember. Love. The eyes on Twig went blank for a moment. Then they suddenly turned green instead of violet. The Timberwolf whined, then nudged me. He looked concerned, then he sniffed the air and looked at the dead mare who raised me and whined more, nudging her hind leg. Slowly, I got back to my hooves and walked back to Ravane's body. I felt tears in my eyes as I looked down at her lifeless form. How do I know if this is real or if I'm going crazy? She couldn't answer me. The mare who raised me and taught me how to be the mare I am today was dead. She wouldn't be able to come over for dinner with the family. She would never again tell me that I was being stupid. She wouldn't be able to teach Night Blossom how to build robots. I killed her. I snuffed her beautiful light from the world because all she was trying to do was keep me safe. Or is Ori Callus really there, trying to help me see through this world that felt so strange to me at times? Words from serendipity in one of Mom's memory orbs came back to me. Remember that timber wolves can be the wisest of creatures sometimes. Why would she leave me a message like that unless she knew what was going to happen? I looked over at the now normal timber wolf who was looking back at me. The wounds her vein gave me were still dripping with something green instead of black. Yet, somehow, my uncle used this creature to tell me what I needed to know. If I was really trapped inside my own mind, then I was caged like Aquila had been for so many years. Only in this cage, she was keeping me in a world where she never existed. One where Mom came back to me. Where I got what I always wanted. A family to call my own. My Mom back with me. Her memories back. Foals of my own. A normal life. I took a moment to think back on what I knew here and what I knew from the other life. Both matched up until my trip to the kingdom where Aura died. In both worlds, I did go to Mill City Tower, but in this world, Stryker saved me. He was the stranger and helped protect me. In the other was my father, who was playing two sides. One of the council pony, and the other, my protector. Later in this world, I went around attacking a lot of ponies in my anger, only to be stopped by Wind Thrasher, Solstice, Vervain, Wingnut, and Mom. In the other, I found out that Aura survived, and so did Stardust. I fell in love with Aura, and she was my soulmate. In this world, I was with Wingnut, but also with Solstice, a mare in the other world that I respected now, but could never see myself falling for. I also don't think she swung my way in the other world, though I couldn't really say what way she went. I didn't know her well enough. Which world made sense, which matched up with who I was before, the discrepancies in my memories. The sad truth was, it didn't take long to figure it out. This world had too many holes in it. Envy would never work for me and befriend me. He hated me more than anything on Equus, and I can't see how Mom would have gotten her memories back. As much as I loved Wingnut, he was more like a little brother to me than a husband. Solstice was fun in this world, but her personality didn't match up. Also, where was Doorstop? Where was Windthrasher? Why did Vervain hit me the way she did? 
No, something was off. And if Ori Kalos was right, then I have to do something bad enough that Aquila thinks I'd never be able to think about trying to do. I looked back at Twig. What wouldn't I do in the other world? The Timberwolf just stared at me, so I sighed and looked at her vein. I'd never hurt the ponies I love. At least not like that. I knew what I had to do, and I'm just not sure I can go through with it. Sad thing is, if I want to stop her, I'm going to have to become a monster. Just like Aquila. I looked down at her vein's body again and ran a hoof over her mane, then closed her lifeless eyes. I'm sorry, Auntie Vervain. I just hope that I'm not going crazy. I moved back towards Twig, patted his head for a moment, then sighed and headed out of the cave. Twig followed me out of the darkness and back into the world I needed to destroy. As I stepped out of the cave, I took a deep breath, let everything good inside me fade away. You think you can lock me up inside my own mind, Aquila? Fine. Bring it on. Shadow, where have you been? Mom asked as I walked into the house. Dinner already prepared. Vervain was showing me stable 28. I thought it would help with memories, I said as I walked over to sit at the table with my foals and wingnut. I figured everything would be better by now, Mom said, joining us. It's never taken this long before. Wingnut swallowed what he was eating, then laughed, saying, She's fine, Grim. Back off. Yeah, I'm fine, Mom, I said with a sigh. Most of it's come back now. She looked at me for a long moment, then said slowly, Okay, but if you start having problems again, let me know. I will, I said as I started to eat. Shining Star jumped onto his chair, saying loudly, Mom, can you tell me a story tonight? Mom answered him. Shining, I thought you liked my stories. He jumped up and down. I do, Grandma, but I want to hear about when Mom was fighting the sins. He added a dramatic voice to the last word. I sat back in my chair. Huh. I don't know. Some of those stories aren't for little colts. But I want to hear it. Please? He begged. Mom, just tell him about when you fought at Frosty Summit. That one's not too bad. At least no pony died there. Night Blossom said. Well, not any of my friends. But I can't say the same for the ponies who lived there. I said. Oh, just tell him the story. It's about his bedtime anyway, Wingnut said. I'll put Night Blossom to bed and see you later tonight, okay? I smiled and said, Okay. Can't Grandma put me to bed, Dad? I want to show her some more Ravane showed me today, Night Blossom said. Wingnut yawned and gave in. Fine. I guess I'll head to bed now. I got up and smiled. Okay. Time for bed, you little renegade. Awesome, Shining Star said as he ran towards his bedroom. Night Blossom, I'll be there in a minute. I want to have a word with your mother, Mom said. Okay, Grandma, I want to finish reading something anyway, my little fool said, getting up and trotting towards her room. See ya, Shadow, Wingnut said, kissing me quickly, then heading towards our room. So what's up, Mom? I asked. Why didn't Vervain come to dinner? She told me this morning that she'd be stopping by tonight, Mom asked. Oh, she wasn't feeling well. She said she's going to go back to bed early, I replied. Why didn't you tell me when you got back? If she's not well, I need to go check up on her, Mom asked again. Mom, she's fine. She's just been working too much lately. She just needs rest, I replied. Suddenly feeling like a character from a graphic novel I once read about serial murderers that was working with the detective who was investigating him. She looked at me for a long moment and sighed, saying, Okay, I guess I'm just worrying over nothing. Go get Shining to bed. I'm sure he's jumping all over his room waiting for you. All right, Mom, I'll see you tomorrow, I said as I headed towards my colt's room. A little while later, I was finishing up my story about the fight at Frosty Summit, as Shining laid there in his bed, his eyes half open. And with the help of Dad and your friends, the sins ran away and their tails tucked between their legs, and you won? He asked sheepishly. 
I smiled. I had told him most of what happened during the fight, but changed the story up a little bit. He didn't need to know all the details. I sure did. Now, time for you to get some sleep, shrimp. I kissed his horn as he yawned again, asking, Can you sing me a song? Sure. I'd love to. I said as my hoof started to shake. How could I do what I was thinking? He was such a sweet colt. So happy. Like I used to be when I was little. No. This world isn't real. I needed to do this. As wonderful as a colt as he was, he was just an illusion. He snuggled up the blanket and his eyes closing as I started to sing the song Phantom Shot's daughter sang the recording he kept with him. I started rubbing a hoof over his mane, pulling one of his pillows extra closer. He started to snore as I moved the pillow up with my hooves, placing it over his little face. With my hooves on each side of the pillow, I pressed it down hard over my colt's face, doing my best to hold back my tears. His little hooves jerk, and he started to struggle under me, but I held the pillow tighter. Little sounds of panic barely making it past the pillow. After a minute, his struggle slowed. His hooves finally stopped moving, and I fell to the bed with one last twitch. Tears were falling now as I waited for a moment, then finally lifted the pillow from my son's face. His eyes were locked in terror, looking up at the ceiling with no light in his beautiful eyes. Slowly, I used a hoof to close them, finishing my song. I started to cry into the pillow, overwhelmed with sadness. I killed my own son, my own flesh, blood, and magic, the pony who gave him life only to take it away. It took me a minute to recover fully, falling back to the thoughts of how this world wasn't real, but it felt real. I just killed a colt, and he would be the first one to die tonight. I felt horrible for the murder. I could even remember his first step, his first word, the first time he used a spell. I got back to my hooves, placing the pillow back where I found it. I moved Shining Legs back to the position where it looked like he was just a sleeping little colt, covered his body with his blanket, and then slowly walked back out of the room. The house was quiet now, as I slowly walked back towards the hall to my living room. No pony was there apart from Twig. He was asleep on the couch again his limbs twitching as he dreamed of something. I moved towards my front door as I tried to banish the fake memories away. I unlocked the door, then stepped outside. Rain fell on me as I walked to the Question Express. As I did, more memories of my son came to me, like the time that he drew me a picture, or when he came into my room at night because he had a bad dream. It's not real. None of this is real. I told myself as I pulled out the key from my, no, box tapes shop, and unlocked the door. Slowly, I walked in and went towards the wall where misery was still framed. When I realized that none of this was real, I knew what I'd have to do. I'd need a weapon if I was going to take on Mom and the others, but I couldn't use the rifles from her vein. It was too much of a risk if I was going to get caught coming back into town with one. So, I needed my sword. Mom didn't trust me with weapons. But she always let me keep misery as long as it stayed on the wall. The only problem was that my magic was shit because of my cracked horn. When I learned how to use this weapon, I used my magic. I couldn't do a lot by holding misery with my muzzle. The sword was meant for griffins, not ponies. I needed to be able to wield it like I had talons. The only way I could make this work was I had to believe that my horn was fine. My magic was still powerful. Even if I wasn't a cage, it was still my own head. So closing my eyes, I pulled on my magic. For a moment, I thought it was going to work. Then pain ran down my horn again. I wanted to scream, but I kept trying, until something gave and the pain vanished. My eyes snapped open as I felt my magic take hold of misery. My magic was nowhere near as strong as I was used to, but a lot better than it had been over the past few days. I wasn't able to rely on my teleportation or explosive spells then. But I should be able to use misery. It would have to do. I pulled it off the wall, then turned towards my old set of armor and pulled it down. I put on my barding and duster, taking in the scent of dirt and sweat that still lingered on the outfit. I had a long, painful night ahead of me. 
It was time for the courier of the wastes to make her grand return and deliver nothing but death. One of the steps to the upstairs creaked. I twisted around quickly to see Envy looking down at me sleepily. Shadow, what are you doing here so late? Oh, Envy, it's just you. I said with a sigh. What are you doing up there? Sleeping, you idiot. What do you think? I use the apartment when I'm in town, he said, coming the rest of the way down the steps. Then his eyes fell on misery and my outfit. What are you doing? I couldn't help but smile crazed Lee, as I said. What does it look like, Envy? It looks like you're ready to kill something. You know, Grimm said you shouldn't use that stuff again. He said, sounding concerned. Envy sounded concerned. Yeah, this isn't right. What does Aquila take me for, an idiot? I started to laugh as lightning flashed outside. Damn, Envy. What did she do to make you so pathetic? Pathetic? The hell are you talking about, shrimp? I'm still Envy, but I found a better way to live. He said, sounding offended. I laughed harder. Envy the Jealous, first member of the Seven Swins of Equinity, is really happy living as a courier working for me? His eyes flared a little. I'm doing this because I have no other choice. Why does it shock you that I want to be a better pony? Because you're not a pony, I yelled. You're a changeling that wants to be a pony. You take that back, you bitch, he yelled. Make me, I taunted, sticking my tongue out like an immature preteen. He growled and turned to a griffin, then back into a pegasus and took another step back. Shadow, what's wrong with you? I'm sick of this life, Envy. Sick of living my life like I'm a fucking nobody. I want my old life back. I want to kill. I took a step toward him, saying, Come on, Envy. I know you miss your old life, back when you were feared. I know you want to be a sin again. I could see it in his eyes. My words were getting to him. Slowly, a smile came to his face as he said, I do miss ponies fearing my name, feared the sins. But with pride, I mean, Nori Callus gone, there are no more sins. Not without him. My laugh came out like I snapped. <laughs> Envy, I'm his niece. I'm just as dark as he was. I am pride. It'll be so easy to tear apart this pathetic town with you and me. So what do you say? You want to make every pony fear the sins again? Shorty, where was this fire ten years ago? I would have liked you a lot more back then if you were this crazy before. He said with a laugh I knew all too well. So, ready to make some mayhem? I asked. He hit one hoof against another, smirking that envy smirk that I knew oh too well. Oh, you know it. He said. Then his face fell. But what about Grimm and your family? Grimm's gone soft. And what family? I said as I turned to head out the door. Okay. As much as I love to kill and destroy, I can't hurt Grimm. It goes against my nature. I'll hurt her, but I can't kill her. He said. I had a feeling he'd say that. But I needed him to help me. In my world, there was no way I'd ever help Envy. Not like this. He was crazy. Loved to kill. Loved to be the best. I needed to be the crazy, deadly pony my uncle was. And in my world, that wasn't something I could do. If I killed him, that was something I'd do in my world. If I couldn't get him to help with Mom, then I'd have to get him to help me with another task. Fine. I can deal with her myself. Go find Wind Thrasher for me. I have fun plans for her and this town. His smirk returned, saying, I don't like the idea of you killing Grimm, but I'm not going to stop you. I like the idea of letting this town bleed from that monster, though. This place is a shithole anyway. I'll see you in a little while, shorty. He headed out the door with me, opening his wings before he could fly off, though, I said. 
Envy? Call me pride. He laughed again. Not yet, Shorty. If you can prove to me that you're just as deadly as the real pride, then we'll see. With that, he was gone. The storm was raging now, and I took in the smell of falling on the dirt and rocks around me. As I stood there in the small doorway of my house open, and Wingnut's voice echoed towards me, Shadow, what are you doing out in the rain? I looked down at the road at him. Moving closer, I said, I couldn't sleep. I felt like something was going to happen. I couldn't get the thought out of my head, so I went to get my barding. As I spoke, I hid misery under my duster. You could have woken me, he said as he walked into the house. Why don't you get out of that and come to bed? I put on a seductive face and moved closer to him, saying, But I thought you used to love how I looked in my duster. He blushed and grinned like a colt. I mean, that was a long time ago. I nibbled his ear, then whispered, Haven't you ever wanted to dominate the courier? A shiver ran over his spine as he said, I mean, the thought did cross my mind when I was young. I slowly walked past him and let my tail run under his chin. Maybe you can do that now. Stallions were way too easy to manipulate. It took everything in me not to think about what I was doing as I led my husband to our bedroom, past the closet and the closed door to our dud son's room. Once we were in, he pushed me onto the bed and laid on top of me, kissing me deeply. I let out a fake moan as I kissed him back, letting my magic move to misery out from under the duster and under the pillow. Then I let him pull my barding off me. Does the big bad courier mare really think she can get away from me? He said, trying to do some kind of weird role play. I did my best to answer. You can't get away with this. Oh, but I will. He said playfully, twisting me around and laying my, lifting my tail as he moved over me. Wingnut, pin me down or something. On my back, it's more realistic. I said. Oh, sorry. He said, letting me roll on my back. Then he was over me again, pinning my hooves down as he spread my weary legs on his own. I moved my head up to kiss him before he could enter me, then moved my head next to his as if I was going to whisper something seductive. My next words weren't those of a horny wife or lover. I love you, Wingnut, and I'm sorry I have to do this. I felt him brush the inside of my legs as he said, I love you. Wait, sorry for what? The magic took hold of misery again, and I moved it out from under the pillow under me. Before he could even comprehend what I said, I slipped the blade between his ribs. Lignut's eyes went wide and his muzzle opened as he tried to scream in pain. He wasn't able to, though. Misery just slipped through one of his lungs that was now pressed against his heart. He gagged, then fell to one side as he looked over at me in confusion. Tears started to fall again as I kissed his lips one last time ignoring the blood dripping down from them. I'm sorry. This has to be done. He was trying to breathe, but it was hard. But he did manage to quietly say, Don't understand, I... I didn't let him finish what he was going to say. I let misery slide further into him, piercing his heart, then his other lung, as the point poked out the other side. For a moment, his eyes went wide. Then the light went off. I pulled Misery out, the blood dripping off it quickly, as if the sword couldn't stand the blood of such a good stallion on it either. I closed his eyes as I, uh, as the blood soaked our bed, the bed where my son was conceived, where I made love to him on many nights when I felt guilty for what I was doing with Solstice. It's not real, I said as I backed away from the body of the stallion I saved as a colt. I put my barning back on and slid misery into the holster at my side, took in a deep breath and headed out the door. I'd have to go deal with Mom next. She was the biggest danger to me right now. I had no way to fight her magic, so I'd have to catch her in her sleep. So I moved down the hall to the room she shared with my daughter. Slowly, I turned the knob and opened the door. 
I was about to pull Misery out of its sheath when I saw that No Pony was in the room. Night Blossom? Mom? No Pony answered. Well, where's my daughter and mother? I took a moment to check the room before turning and heading down the hall. I had to find them, before Mom realized what I'd been doing. This wasn't the first time Mom wasn't home during this time of night. Same for Night Blossom. Both of them are night owls. When they couldn't sleep, they went to Ravane's shop on the edge of town to work on small projects late into the night. Those two were very close. Sometimes I thought that Mom saw a lot of me and my daughter, and wanted to be able to have that kind of relationship we should have had when I was young. On most nights, that wouldn't have been a problem. But if Mom went to the small apartment over Ravane's shop and saw she wasn't there, I could be in a lot of shit. Twig, get up. I said as I got back to the living room. Go find Mom or Night Blossom. I need them back home. Remember Wolf yawned. Then got to his paws, and he growled a little as his injury flared up. Timberwolves heal at a miraculous rate. He moved towards the door that had just opened for him and ran into the storm. Mom knew that if I sent Twig out so late, it meant I needed her for something. Or I was just pissed that Night Blossom and her were out so late. She'd see my Timberwolf, roll her eyes, and come on home after making me wait half an hour just so she could prove that she didn't have to do what I wanted all the time. I had something else to deal with while I waited for her. I went over to Solstice's room. It was about to knock on the door when it opened, and she saw me standing there with a grin. A little late for a nightcap, don't you think, Shadow? Is it ever too late? I asked, kissing her and pushing her back into the house. Oh, some pony missed me today, Solstice said, kissing me back. I was going to try the same thing that with her that I did with Wingnut, but some pony outside decided that I had to change the plans. A mare screamed out in the streets, then her voice was cut off. I pulled away from Solstice, saying, What was that? I was going to ask you the same, Solstice stated to say as the door to her home burst open and a bloody envy fell into the room. Envy, Solstice said, going over to him. What's happened to you? He ignored her and looked up at me, saying, She. She's. My eyes went wide. How did this happen to you? Was it Wind Thrasher? She's fucking crazy, Shadow. She's gotten stronger, he said. Then a shadow flew by the door and Envy was ripped away by something. Solstice backed up. What the fuck was that? It has to be Wind Thrasher, I said, pulling Misery out of my barding. What the fuck is she doing here? She asked, looking back at me as her eyes fell on Misery. Shadow, why do you have that? I sighed. Sorry, Solstice. I thought I had longer to do this. I stabbed her in the eye before she could do or say anything. Her body went rigid, then she fell off the end of my sword. Damn it. I didn't want this. I wanted to at least have a little fun before I had to finish you off. Then I shivered as I realized that I sounded a lot like lust. You. More screams came from the town. I ran into the storm and saw a few dead ponies sucking dry blood lying in the streets. How the hell did Envy find her so fast? I thought she was up near Frosty Summit. It should have taken him an hour to get her to follow him back here. Shit, I wasn't ready for her to be here yet. Mom was still alive. There was a flash of blue light, and Mom was there with Night Blossom. Shadow? What's going on? I heard screams. Wind Thrasher's here, I said, looking up at the skies, hoping I could make her out in the storm. Mommy, I want to go home, Night Blossom said in fear. Shit, Mom said, carefully looking around. Shadow, get Night Blossom home. I'll deal with her. Okay, just be careful, I said as I moved towards our home. Then I saw a shadow flying towards my house. Night Blossom, get home quick and get your father. But Mom, I'm scared, she said. It'll be fine. I'll be right behind you. I just need to keep an eye out for danger. Now run, I said. Okay, Mommy. She said, taking to the air and flying to our house. My heart started to pound as I didn't move, and I watched my little filly head right towards 
What would be her death? She just got to the door when the shadow moved off the roof and slammed into the filly, pinning her to the mud. I was frozen when my eyes fell on my old friend. She didn't look like anything I'd remembered. Red scales covered most of her underbelly, legs, and part of her back. They were even working their way up to her neck. Her fangs had grown longer and sharper. Her mane was long and wild, her eyes glowing bright red, and her tail was more like a dragon's rather than a pony's. My daughter screamed in pain and fear as Windthrasher hissed down at her, her fangs an inch away from her eyes. Mommy, help! Night Blossom! Mom screamed from behind me. Shadow, do something! I didn't move. I just looked over at Windthrasher, who still hadn't killed the small filly in her hooves. When my daughter screamed, Windthrasher's head moved further away, then she looked over at me. All I could see in those eyes was hunger that could never be satisfied. The bat pony grinned, showing her razor-sharp teeth. Then she spoke in that voice of a demon. Shadow Star, it's been too long. Mom ran up next to me but stopped when Windthrasher pressed a claw onto my crying daughter's chest. I just watched, saying, You're looking well, Windthrasher. Did you change your mane? Shadow, we have to do something, Mom said, her horn glowing. Don't try. Windthrasher said, or I'll slit her throat. Mom stopped her spell, then said, Windthrasher, don't hurt her, please. Why? Who is this filly to me apart from a delicious treat? Windthrasher asked with a sick-sounding laugh. She's my daughter, Windthrasher, I said, not taking my eyes off of hers. I don't know what happened between us, but she's just a filly. Let her go. Don't remember, Windthrasher said with a, another sick laugh. You killed ponies I loved, ponies I cared about. Don't you remember what you did to Trotston four years ago? Windthrasher, that wasn't Shadow. She lost the rangefinder a long time ago. I told you that after it happened, Mom said, her voice sounding scared. Windthrasher just smiled wider. Liar. I know who did it. You can't protect her all the time, Grim. I saw her go crazy again, watched as she stole the rangefinder from you and used it to destroy my old stable's inhabitants. Strange, I don't remember doing that. Maybe it's one of those memories I hadn't gotten back yet. Oh well, if Windthrasher said it happened, then I guess it did. Still, didn't matter. I needed her here, just not yet. So I shrugged and said, Not much of a loss, if you ask me. I thought that would anger the crazy bat pony, but it didn't. She looked down at my crying daughter and asked, Do you love this full shadow? What about you, Grim? With all my heart, I said. Of course I do, Mom replied. Now, please leave her alone. Good. When Thrasher used her sharp claws to stab my filly in the belly, she screamed as blood poured out of her. Mom did as well, her horn starting to glow again, but Wind Thrasher was faster. She lifted Night Blossom up with her and returned hooked claws, then used her other to cut a deep line across my filly's little throat. Her eyes went wide and she gagged on her own blood. No! Mom screamed. Wind Thresher licked the blood, then dropped the filly into the mud. Her little body didn't move as a pool of blood mixed with the rain. You reap what you sow. I'll fucking kill you! Mom screamed as zebra glyphs formed around her. I put a hoof on Mom's shoulder, forcing her to look at me. It's too late. She just killed your filly, Shadow! Mom said through tears. I took a step back and sighed. No. She killed something that isn't real. Just how I killed Wingnut, Shining Star, and Solstice. Mom's eyes went wide. No. Shadow, this is real. Please don't tell me you did that. Windthrasher just watched with a smile as I said, I did. Then before she could react, Misery flipped out from under my duster again and sliced cleanly through my mother's neck. Her face looked up with shock right before Misery cut her head clean off. Mom's head rolled to the ground, followed by a spray of blood. Then slowly, her body fell to the ground and twitched slightly. 
I looked down at her body for a long moment, then looked back at Windthrasher, who was laughing. So, you finally snapped and killed your family. I was wondering how long that was going to take. I had to. It's the only way to free myself from this place. As far as I can tell, you're the last one left, I said. She moved closer to me, stepping over the body of my dead daughter. I didn't even care anymore. It was like the more I killed the ones I cared about, the less I cared about them. As much as I wanted to feel something for the dead foal, all I could see was a filly that had promise. But she wasn't mine. Just another prize the Wasteland claimed. Once Wind Thrasher was close, she took in a deep breath, then let it out with a sound of utter ecstasy, saying, I love the smell of fresh blood. It's even better coming from that mare. Out of all the ponies in this world, Wind Thrasher, you're the one I'm saddest about seeing. I never wanted you to become what you are, I said. She let out a little purr of pleasure as she said, You should have known by now that you can't change what's in another's nature. Look at you. For years you try to be normal, but you aren't. You were born to be a killer, just how I was made to be one. I should have killed you before you got like this, Windthrasher, I said. Why? I really don't mind this. Not as much as I used to. After all, it's what Dr. Cell wanted me to be. A monster. She said as she started to walk around me. What'd you do to Envy? I asked, changing the subject. Now, that bug was wanting to act like he was stronger than me. I cut his head off and threw him over your pathetic walls. I would have drained him too, but sadly I don't like bugs. She said with a giggle. Too bad. I want to see how far he'd go before he died. Ah, uh, well, I guess it can't be helped. So tell me, Windthrasher, what are you going to do now? Easy. I want you to end what you started ten years ago. She pulled something out of the battered saddlebag she had with her and tossed it on my hooves. It was the rangefinder. How did you get this? I asked. You left it on the ground when you blew up Trotston. I want you to use it to kill me, she said, taking a few steps back. That caused me to look up at her. I thought that you wanted me dead. I thought you liked being what you are. She grinned. If you don't kill me, I'll kill you. And then hundreds more before I finally bite the dust. Now put me out of my misery, she said, her voice almost sounding normal again, like the real Wind Thrasher was still in there, begging for me to end what she became. But you better hurry. The Red Talons aren't far behind me. They'll do anything to protect this town, you know. They were hunting me when Envy ran into me and told me you were looking for me. So I thought it'd be fun to lead him right here. I was when why did that, because there were still a few more things I had left to do before I could finish this. The rain was starting to let up a little, and in the distance I could see at least 50 griffins flying towards Cartwheel. I could make out the white griffin that I thought was dead. Gigi was coming with her children and her best fighters. So in this world she was still alive, and now I have to kill her again. The mother of the griffin that I loved, along with her sisters. But I couldn't let Windthrasher die. That left me with only one choice. If you want me to kill you, then you'll have to make me. I said, then I slashed a shallow wound on her chest, picked up Solar Flare's Rainfinder, and ran for it. Get back here, Shadow! Windthrasher yelled as I made my way to the edge of town. I'd only have one chance at this, so I ran, hoping I could avoid the crazy bat pony long enough to make it out of town. Solar Flare's Rainfinder held in my magic, along with misery. I reached the edge of town and dove through the gate right as Windthrasher flew over and slammed me into the ground. I twisted around and watched as the Red Talons flew into town. They noticed the death around them and saw me at the gate along with Windthrasher, who was getting back to her hooves. Gigi yelled as loud as she could. Shadow, behind you! I ignored her and pointed the rangefinder at her instead, saying... Sorry, Gigi, but it's time to retire. Shadow, what are you? She started to say. I pulled the trigger. A symbol shot up onto Gigi's chest, and I watched as her eyes turned to horror as what she knew I just did. I backed up as the yellow light fell from the sky, then expanded to enclose all of Cartwheel and its barrier. 
every single griffin still inside, along with every pony who lived in the town. No, that was meant for me! Wind Thrasher screamed as she slammed me to the ground next to me. I didn't care. I just watched as Gigi looked at me in horror through the yellow light. Then the clouds vanished inside and bathed them all in moonlight. I watched as Gigi, her daughters, and her best fighters in the town I loved vanished in a bright light. This is how it should be. Cartwheel was no longer a town. It was just a ruin with one building still standing in my world. Gigi was dead in my world. Same for a few of the griffins I saw with her thanks to the unchained talons. Let them all return to ash. When the spell ended, hot air flowed over Windthrasher and me. Nothing but a glowing crater where the town once stood. Then I picked up and got thrown down the road by the crazed Windthrasher. Why did you do that? I wanted to die! I hate you! I just looked up at my friend and sighed. That's too bad, Windthrasher. Because I love you. I love you so much that if I could, I'd put you down. Not because I hate you or because it's the right thing to do for the wasteland. No, I'd do it because where I'm really from, I wouldn't let you live like this. The wind thrasher I know wanted to end her, just like you do. I would kill you, but in here I can't. Not right now. You're on the edge of becoming a true monster. She growled at me and used her scream on me. My ears felt like some pony just stabbed them with a knife and I was thrown back into a rock. I felt one of my legs break as I hit it and screamed. The sound was nothing more than a dull echo. Then I felt her pick me up and slam me to the ground again. As she did, my ears started to pick up the sounds around me again, and I could just make out my friend. I am a monster, you fucking bitch, she said as she slammed me to the ground again. I'll make you kill me one way or another. It was hard to breathe, but I managed to get out. I'll never kill you, so either kill yourself like a fucking coward, or let the beast out and kill me. I'm done. I don't care anymore. All I could see in my friend's face was anger. She bore her teeth and growled, her eyes glowing and even darker red. Fine. If you want to die, then so be it. I don't care anymore either. I smiled a little, but deep in the back of my mind, I was scared that I was wrong about this whole thing. Can't go back now. Time to find out if the goddesses are real, and same for this world, or if I was really stuck in my own mind. I closed my eyes as the last friend opened her muzzle, sharp fangs coming down from my throat, and prayed. Luna of the night, Celestia of the day, forgive me for what I've done. When Thresher's fangs sank deep into my throat, digging deep into my neck, blood poured from the places where her fangs sliced through my skin. Two of her longer ones dug through my windpipe, and blood started to flow into my lungs. I tried to gag, but Windthresher tightened her jaw so I couldn't even swallow or move my neck at all. I couldn't even scream as pain filled my mind. My legs kicked against her, her hard scales as my body protested against this violent act. The body wants to live. I kicked and bucked, but it didn't help one bit. My head started to go foggy. My brain wasn't getting enough oxygen. My body started to go cold. The thrashing slowed, my body going stiff. And then I felt something change in what Wind Thrasher was doing. Blood started to flow up into her maw. I could feel my body shriveling as the blood left my body. My sight faded to black. Sounds around me vanished, and I was left with nothing but pain as my friend sucked me dry. Damn. Dying was painful. Odd. Death felt a lot like the chamber inside my head where a quill was trapped most of the time. Either that, or I had one fucked up dream and wet the bed. If I did, I gotta remember not to drink so much before bed. I hope it wasn't a ladder. That would suck. I was laying in a thin layer of water. It was warm. Not a good sign if my other idea was true. I opened my eyes and almost laughed as I saw the white world inside my own head. I got to my hooves, hoping that everything I saw was a dream, even the part about Aquila taking over. I looked around and felt my heart sink at what I saw. In the middle of the white chamber, a destroyed cage. The same I had seen Aquila in last time I was here. I looked behind me and saw the remains of a black metal box. That must have been my cage. I wondered if Aquila did that or something else happened to me. As that thought came, a small voice said, 
Yes, I did do that to you. Well, a part of me did. I twisted back around towards the voice and saw a small white light. It was no bigger than a bullet for Dreamwalker. What are you? The light pulsed as it spoke. I'm Aquila, but I'm also not Aquila. Get away from me, I yelled. Shadow, I'm not the dark part of my power. The one you've known since you first met me. I'm the small spark of good left. She said as she flew around me, then stopped an inch from my nose. What good? You're nothing but evil, I said. No pony's truly evil. Not even a creature like me who spent 200 years locked up in a lab forced to feel the suffering of this land, she said. You're not a pony. You're just a collection of magic that has a consciousness. An evil one, I said. After being stuck with me for so long, I can't believe you'd think that. I have a soul just as much as you do. But sadly, over the years, I've let my anger and hatred for what has done to me when I was still new change what I was meant for, she said. I don't understand, I said. I know. Let me try this. I was created to be a force for good in Equestria, a force to fix this world. My father wanted me to come to Equus a lot later than I did. Since I wasn't fully developed when I came down here because of the children of the night, I could not understand the feelings around me or block them she explained. I had to force myself to block my feelings so I could survive the torment, and I let myself grow dark. This little part of me is still good, and filled with light that pushed further and further away as the years went on. That was until I became part of you, Shadow. How would merging with me help the light? I asked. A giggle came from the light, and it whizzed around the chamber again, then stopped in front of me once more saying, Silly filly, it's part of what makes you who you are. You haven't realized it yet, but you have a gift. One unlike any pony on Equus has ever before. It's because of that gift that I was able to stay so strong as I am now. I rolled my eyes. Yeah, I'm so fucking special. If that's true, then what gift do I have? I can't tell you that, Shadow. You have to figure that out on your own. It's part of your special talent, after all. She said happily. Great. More secrets. I said with a sigh. It's not a secret. You just need to start listening to your heart, and you'll be able to understand. Look back to your life, and that'll also help. But I can't just tell you. In your world, a pony needs to figure out who they are on their own. It's part of growing up. I said. Fine. Then can you at least tell me what's going on with Aquila? I rose my hooves up and swayed them a little as I, making air quotes then added so do I call you good Aquila or something else? she giggled again no matter what part of me you talk with, I'm still the same creature just a separate entity I'd say this is making my head hurt but I'm not even sure this is my head anymore I said, rubbing my eyes I can't even figure out if I'm still in a cage my own head or if I'm being punished for the evil I committed just now I'm sorry you had to go through that. It was the only way to break the locks the other me put on the cage. I thought, or the other me thought, you wouldn't be able to do what you did. I think she underestimated you. The Aquila, not Aquila, said. Nah, say that ten times fast. I just wish I could forget it all. I don't want to remember killing those foals, my mother, my friends, watching Wind Thrasher become a monster. I said as the memories of what I just did started to slam into me. It's horrible. I wish I could take the pain away, but you have to live with it. If you can overcome what you were capable of doing in that fake world, you'll come out the other side as a better pony and wiser, she said. My eyes went wide as I thought about what happened before the cage. Did you, or the other you, kill my friends? Did she really take over? What happened? The small light floated back a little as she said. She has your body for three days now. Even now, she's finishing up one of the last things she has to do before you take over again. What do you mean? I asked. The other part of me has known you were breaking out for a day now. Once she pulled your uncle out, she knew what was happening, so she started to do what she had to before you got your body back. She said, sounding sad. Like what? I asked. I don't know. She's blocked some of it from me and you. 
Whatever she's doing, though, it isn't good, she said. You have to know something. What about my friends? I asked. I know that the friends you traveled with are fine. This also means Rory Callis and your mother are fine as well. I can't say the same for the rest. Like I said, she's blocked a lot from us both. All you can do now is take over again and try to stop what she started. You're going to have to get grim before it's too late. You won't have long before her plan comes to fruition, she said, sounding like she was in a hurry. Can Mom really help me? Also, what happens if I'm able to stop her plan? I asked. If you're lucky, then you'll survive. But both sides of us won't. Worst case is, we all die. Either way, all you have to do is what you have left. Whatever you do, don't ever try to kill yourself again. That's what made her take over when she did. If you feel her losing control again, just let it happen. You're strong enough to get control back, even if it takes a while. She said. Are you sure? I asked. I am. Now, be ready for this next part. Both our minds, including the other me, is about to reset. When it does, you might see what happened while you were trapped. Or not. Either way, as soon as you're back in control, be ready to head to Los Alicorn as fast as you can. She said as the room around us started to grow dark. In the distance, I could hear the chilling laugh of the Aquila I knew all too well. How do I know you can trust you? I asked quickly. She giggled again. Trust is not something you can afford anymore. You don't need to trust me. You'll know I'm right when you get control again. She said. She stopped talking and as a rumble went through the chamber. Then she spoke again. No. Is she crazy? What happened? I asked. She spoke quickly, ignoring my question. Don't go into the core. Call for help as soon as you can, and whatever you do, don't try fighting security. What security? What's going... The world exploded into light, then vanished. The last thing I heard, as everything went black, was Aquila. This'll keep you busy, Shadow Star. <laughs> I opened my eyes once I felt my body lying on a hard ground. Groaning, I slowly sat up, wondering if I was in another fake world or my own body again. I opened my eyes and winced as fresh pain flowed through my body. It wasn't physical pain. It felt like I was using too much magic at once too quickly. I took a moment to relax my breathing, then opened my eyes. First thing I saw, that I was anywhere nowhere near Las Pegasus or uh, Las Alicorn. The air around me was thick and had a green hue to it. I was dizzy and slightly foggy out. In the distance, I could hear gunshots and screams. I rubbed my head, then looked down at my body. My coat was back to its normal black. My Mark II was still with me, and I could feel my magic weakly inside of myself. In the very far depths of my mind, I could just make out Aquila's presence. I felt like she was sleeping, but not caged up anymore. She let me go. But why? What did she mean that she said this should keep me busy? Right now, I couldn't worry about that. I needed to get hold of my friends. Somehow, I had to let them know that I was alive. And the question was, how was I going to go about that? I needed to know where I was and how far I'd gone to get a broadcast of them. So I got to my hooves. I looked around, trying to get some idea of where I was. In the distance, I could see a huge black city surrounded by a green haze. A huge black tower going right up into the clouds at its center. Something about it seemed familiar, almost like I'd seen it before. But with my head still pounding from the hell I'd just escaped, I couldn't think of where I'd seen the city. Well, one thing's for sure, I'm not even close to home, I said to myself. I was on an old freeway that led towards the city. A few feet down the crumbling road, I saw a sign that was slightly covered by the fog. I shook my head again and started to walk closer to it. As I moved, I realized that I had no armor on, no saddlebags, and none of my weapons. The only thing I had was my Mark II, just like the day I escaped my stable. No, wait, even then I had security baton and some lightly armored stable 28 barding. This is gonna suck. Finally, the sight came into focus, and as soon as my eyes ran over the words, I felt my stomach sink. My heart stopped, and I wanted some pony to just shoot me right now. 
Anything would have been better than what I just read. Welcome to Hoofington. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Miss Sand Pony. After you've experienced in the cage, you've gained the ability to kill anyone in their sleep silently. Just remember to close the door first, you devious little murderer, you. Region perk added. Star Eater. Due to your proximity to Hoofington and its innervation, Aquila will be less of a problem for you while you stay in this region. However, once you leave, everything will go back to normal. <laughs>